I, th I think I better just go home. There's no way I can follow that, that last fantastic uh, talk. Um, so, a lack of knowledge about who ultimately controls, owns, and profits from companies leads to aggressive tax avoidance, tax evasion, and money laundering, undermining tax bases and fueling corruption across the world. Therefore, the G8 and the European Union must work together to ensure full transparency in beneficial ownership. Now, this is what you might have been expecting to hear from a campaigner like me. But these aren't my words. These are the words of David Cameron, obviously the UK Prime Minister. And last year, he started to voice his concern about how a sound business principle, the right to set up and own a company, is being systematically abused by criminals across the planet. And this was a huge turning point in the campaign to stop anonymous company ownership, which is an issue that is affecting all of us. We're all being ripped off by anonymous company ownership, if particularly the poorest on the planet. But before I get into that, I'd like to take you back to where this all started for me. So um, one rainy Sunday afternoon in North London, kind of a couple, just a couple of miles away really, in my late 20s, so a long time ago, um, I was sitting with two friends and colleagues, Simon Taylor and Patrick Alley, and we were busy stuffing envelopes for a mail out for a, a really great campaign group called the Environmental Investigation Agency. And we often spent our Sundays stuffing envelopes for mail-outs there. And as usual, we were just to pass the time, we're talking about the world's problems and what needed to happen. And in particular, the, war, the civil war in Cambodia, um, a country that lies between Thailand and, and Vietnam. Now, we'd talked about that civil war many, many times before. And we'd heard that one of the parties in this war, the genocidal Khmer Rouge, um, they were using money from illegal logging to keep fighting. And we asked ourselves, well, why isn't anyone doing anything to tackle this problem? And I think we'd asked ourselves that a few times before. And then something happened and we just stopped and looked at each other and said, well, why don't we try and do something? And um, it was this slightly crazy question that really got us going. Because, I mean, the Khmer Rouge, um, they had been responsible for killing two million Cambodians. They were armed and powerful. And we were three people with a conviction that this was wrong and a very untested idea about how to change it. So the odds weren't exactly in our favour. So we did a huge amount of research and built a secret pinhole camera, carefully stitched it into a bag and flew over. We went undercover pretending to be timber buyers, um, claiming we wanted to buy up container loads of, of tropical timber from Cambodia, and all the while we were secretly filming and meticulously documenting the hard evidence of what was going on along that Thai-Cambodia border. And we found that during the dry season, when all the log trucks could move, um, the Khmer Rouge were making about 10 to 20 million dollars a month. So we took the information and published it, exposing the illegal trade and forcing policymakers to take action. The Thai-Cambodia um, land border was closed. That, in turn, helped cut off funding to the Khmer Rouge, and that, in turn, played a part of many, many other parts in ending the war. And so that was the start of Global Witness. So from that slightly crazy question, now, um, two decades and many campaigns later, including alerting the world to the problem of blood diamonds funding war, well, from that crazy question, we're now an 80-strong team of campaigners, investigators, journalists, escapee lawyers. We even have an escapee oil contracts lawyer who's brilliant. So what does Global Witness actually do? Well, we investigate and we report to uncover the people really responsible for funding conflict, for stealing millions from citizens around the country, uh, around the world, and for destroying the environment. And then we campaign to change the system itself. And we do this because so many of the countries rich in natural resources like timber or oil or gas or diamonds are home to some of the poorest and most dispossessed people on the planet. 
this problem of how it is that populations in countries really rich, very rich in natural resources, and how these populations tend to stay very, very poor, is known as the resource curse. For me, the resource curse is not so much trickle-down economics, but flood upwards ec ec economics. Now, over the years, in almost all the cases of corruption that we've looked at, we've found one thing in common, and that's the use of anonymous company ownership. And we've seen it time and time again. And whether that's to hide the illicit assets of a corrupt politician, or to obscure the real beneficiaries in a big minerals deal, or to disguise the wholesale looting of state assets. Now, a World Bank study from a few years ago looked at over 200 cases of large-scale corruption across 80 countries, so pretty global. Um, the, those corrupt deals, large-scale deals, were worth about $56 billion. And in looking at those, it found that over 70% had made use of anonymous company ownership. So it is this, amongst other things, that is helping to keep poor countries poor. But it's not just corruption. So these anonymous companies um, have helped a whole host of other crimes as well, whether that's Ponzi schemes to rip off investors, money laundering for the mafia, or fraudsters stealing taxpayer money. The list just goes on and on. Now, I'd like to show you what I mean by starting with a short film um, that looks at the Mexican drugs cartel, the Zetas. Thank you. There is a problem in Mexico. A group of men who control, ruin, and kill. In Mexico, they rule through fear. In America, one man has made it. He has it all. The businesses, the money, the life. He buys, he sells, he wins. This is the story of one family. The good, the bad, and the ugly truth. An American company laundering Mexican drug money. Three brothers, two paths, one dirty secret. The real owners hidden, the profits concealed. This is a problem throughout the world. Anonymous companies have been legal for years. Like a shell, they conceal owners, protect criminals. But the shell is starting to crack. So this is just one story, um, and we recently published a report about two, three weeks ago uh, called The Great Ripoff, which focuses on America, and it shows how a really wide range of crimes and predatory behavior there has carried, been carried out by anonymous company owners. This included everything from a human trafficking scheme that was likened to modern-day slavery, to selling um, fake health insurance plans, to a government official who was stealing millions of dollars intended for IT products in schools. Uh, also, um, elsewhere, we've seen how um, anonymous company owners have cheated the citizens of the Democratic Republic of Congo, a, company, a country that is really trying to struggle through and recover from years of an incredibly brutal civil war, and how the citizens have lost out on transformational sums of money. Uh, because uh, some anonymous company owners were involved in purchasing valuable mining assets at a fraction of their market value and then flipping them over to major multinationals. Kofi Annan's progress, uh, Africa Progress Panel has estimated that one set of deals alone has uh, lost the country $1.3 billion. Now that's um, twice the country's health and education budget combined. One deal twice the country's health and education budget. Now, anonymously owned companies are not in and of themselves the crime, but, but they are the getaway car of choice for people responsible for all kinds of wrongdoing. And they can make it nearly impossible for law enforcement to do their job. 
And that's why um, uh, officials from Scotland Yard, the FBI and others have all uh, said how concerned they are about this problem and want to do something about it. And I'd like to tell you one more story that illustrates for me really well this issue and it just also shows how global and interconnected uh, the problem is. So Global Witness has been following what happened to a billion dollars that oil giants Shell and the Italian Eni paid for the rights to an oil block in Nigeria. Now we found out that this money was paid to the Nigerian government. It was paid there. The Nigerian government in turn paid the exact same amount to a front company owned by a former Nigerian oil minister who incidentally is also a convicted money launderer. Now, according to Italian prosecutors investigating the deal, half a billion, so half of that deal, was for bribes to Nigerian officials, intermediaries, and managers at ENI. Shell and ENI say they only dealt with the Nigerian government, and both companies have issued statements denying any illegal conduct. Now, the money should have gone to Nigerian state coffers, but it's now gone to five companies well, you've already guessed it, with anonymous owners. And they're part of a, a network of companies headed by obscure individuals. And it's only thanks to the investigations by those authorities that we have any idea where the money may have ended up. Now, knowing who really owned those companies and, um, you know, might not have actually stopped the deal from taking place, and it might not have stopped the money from falling prey to the corruption that Nigeria really struggles with, but its citizens would have been able to find out where the money went and who really benefited from the deal. And a billion dollars might not so easily have been spirited away in a country which, despite vast oil revenues, continues to struggle with desperate poverty. This is a country where a billion dollars is, um, equates to about two-thirds of the country's health budget. Now, I believe that the ability to set up and own a company is a right, as it should be. It's critical to how our economies work. By limiting liability, entrepreneurship is encouraged and business can flourish. And this right must be protected. But there are other rights that are just as important, if not more so, to good business. And it is these that are under threat from the way in which it is currently possible to set up and use companies anonymously. Now, criminals have figured out how to take advantage of the gaps in the law, and where loopholes like this are exploited, they need to be closed, especially when they are enabling so many different types of crimes that damage the society we all live in. It's really time for this to change. I believe that by setting up public registries of the real owners of companies across the world, business can be brought out into the open. And this simple measure, if imp implemented globally, would help to tackle the big and very complex problem that is the reality of corruption. It would be an important step, um, but let's be clear, it, it's not a magic bullet that's going to end all corruption everywhere overnight. Um, and also, let's be honest, changes like this are never easy. So Global Witness and literally hundreds, many hundreds of other groups around the world have been fighting for transparency for two decades, building a transparency movement. But just because an idea is big or difficult, that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do or that it's not possible. And I think you, this audience here, probably understand that better than anyone. And sometimes there is a need to be crazily ambitious. And on this issue, change is already starting to happen. I'd like to talk about the role of the UK. Now, as we know, um, this issue about anonymous companies, it isn't simply about what happens in tropical tax havens, um, tropical island tax havens. So not far from tobacco docks, probably less than a mile, the seeds of modern commerce were being planted back in the 17th century in the coffee houses that preceded the London Stock Exchange and which the London Stock Exchange developed from. Now, these were really humble beginnings for a city that has grown into one of the centres of global finance. But there is an underside to London's growth that is increasingly acknowledged by decision makers. It has become one of the locations of choice for fraudsters, corrupt politicians, 
arms traffickers and others to hide their identity and their illicit cash. So I started with that great quote from David Cameron, calling on the G8 and the European Union to take action. Well, the European Union has recently become the first country in the world to, ha to commit to having and setting up a public registry of the real living human beings behind companies. Now, this is a big deal. And just a few years ago, the, the UK government was openly hostile on this very issue to the idea of these public registries. And we and many other groups campaigning on this together have seen it move from that open hostility to a neutral position, to seeing things differently, and then finally recognizing the need to act. And after consulting with businesses and realizing that it made sense, the government has committed to change. So, maybe surprisingly, um, given that it has been such a haven for, for illicit money, the UK is currently leading the way on what could become a truly global transparency standard. The European Parliament voted massively in favour of public registries, about 90% in favour of doing this back in March. So it's now in the very early stages um, the, the European Parliament, uh, or, sorry, the European Union is now in the very early stages of considering doing the same as the UK. Um, in America, the White House has promised to take action. And um, there is some bipartisan support for a federal bill that could help tackle this problem. And next month, the um, G20 finance ministers will be meeting. Now, they represent the world's top economies, and that includes China and India. And um, action to deal with anonymous companies is on their agenda. So this is an opportunity for being able to develop a truly global response to this very global problem. But this isn't just a policy issue to be left to politicians and decision makers. It's been the work of so many campaign groups around the world to get to this point. Businesses are coming on board too. The campaign, as, as David kindly mentioned, won this year's TED Prize, and eBay founder Jeff Skoll described the, my TED wish as the right move at the right time. Global Witness has started working with the B Team. They're a group of visionary global business leaders who between them have set up and led companies worth many billions of dollars. And they include Virgin founder Richard Branson, uh, telecoms entrepreneur Mo Ibrahim, and Paul Polman of Unilever, amongst many others. Law enforcement of, um, officers are supportive too. The president of the US Federal Law Officers Enforcement Association uh, has said that he wants to help eradicate, and I quote, the corporate foxholes that criminals cower in. Now, understandably, some have raised concerns that this could invade the privacy that each and every one of us has the right to. And in the era of Edward Snowden and the revelations about the NSA, well, we're all really pretty freaked out, I think, about our privacy, our personal privacy. And so anonymity can seem like a way to really hold Big Brother at bay. But this isn't about delving into people's private lives. This is about having enough information to know who really owns a company. So to conclude, I'm not anti-business, far from it, but I am against the practice of secrecy that has such negative impacts for so many. And it is this current acceptance of secrecy in business that has, for example, helped the Mexican drugs cartels to launder billions of dollars through respectable big name banks like HSBC, whilst tens of thousands of people have died in their drug wars. And it is this unquestioning acceptance of secrecy that needs to change. We need to look at this differently, because this isn't about stigmatizing business. This is about recognizing that in the digital era, the world has changed. The way that we think about access to information and about companies and governments, well, it's changed forever, and it's going to keep changing. And I really think that the tide is turning towards transparency, and that at moments like this, norms can shift really quickly. I really think this is an issue whose time has come. Now, this isn't going to be a feel-good overnight success that's going to sort out all crime and corruption in one go. But if that first investigation in Cambodia taught me anything, it's that solutions to these big and complicated problems often have small and unexpected beginnings and that a bit of crazy ambition helps too. Thank you.
Powerful argument. But even if the EU, the US, the G20 decide to block anonymous company registration, surely there's going to be some opportunist smaller company that says, hey, we'll do it. Um, I'm going to speak into your microphone because I'm not mic'd up. So I'm just kind of speaking to his time. Well, that's a really good point. The, the problem is, is that if you take that through to its logical conclusion, you just say, we don't do anything. And this is about creating a truly global standard. Um, so, for example, people tend to prefer, you know, politicians with their dodgy cash tend to put it in places where they can spend it, where there's a good rule of law, where it's, you know, there's a good security situation. And so, ultimately, over time, it will squeeze down those small places where they will um, facilitate this. It's a, lo it's a really long-term, long, long-term... Um, One thing you would like people actually, here to go home and do? Please think about the issue and share um, they, that film, which is part of a map all about called The Rip-Off. It's on our website. Please have a look at it. And, I mean, as a community, I think the wide community can make things happen in a way that no one else can. So please have a look. And if you want to and think it chimes with you, then please share it. Charmy and Gooch, thank you. Thank you.